for that series. But this morning we're going to finish up our Psalms of Hope series. So uh, if, you're, if you are new to West Hills, we've spent this past fall studying through um, the 16 most hope-filled psalms that I could find because God knows, again, we've, we've needed all the hope that we could get these days. And so we found hope uh, in God's listening ear, Psalm, one, uh, psalm 13, God's care, Psalm 23, God's protection, Psalm 27, his redemption, Psalm 30, God's deliverance, Psalm 31, God's goodness, God's faithfulness, his nearness, his help, his trustworthiness, his strength, his rule, his keeping, his, his omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence. And uh, this morning we're going to conclude with Psalm 145. This sermon's entitled, His Greatness is Unsearchable, Our Hope in God and Our Response. So all of our study, in a sense, is going to come to sort of a culmination in this final psalm and its reminder that, that all of our hope is ultimately to be found in God. And as we're going to see, this, the, the final thrust of this psalm isn't just to point us to God. Psalm 40, 145, perhaps more than any other that we've uh, examined together, goes beyond that and it calls us to actually respond to God, to this caring, redemptive, faithful, trustworthy God of ours, a God like that deserves and demands a response from us. And last week, I pointed out that, uh, as A.W. Tozer said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us, that our theology, our view of God, more so than any other single trait about us, is going to shape every aspect of our lives who God is to us will dictate how we respond to him. And how we respond to God means everything. When Polly's mother, Peggy, turned 16, her mother, uh, Polly's grandmother, took her on a sweet 16 uh, visit uh, trip to um, New York City. And one day while they were eating lunch at the plaza, uh, the waitress came over and tapped her on the shoulder, uh, my, my mother-in-law, and said, excuse me, miss, uh, but the gentleman at the table behind you is uh, inviting you to join him for lunch. And so my 16-year-old mother-in-law uh, turned around, looked, and, and saw an attractive um, older man with piercing blue eyes, uh, wink at her and gesture her over. And she was confused and a bit creeped out. Uh, so she turned around and went on finishing her lunch. When her mother gasped, and whispered frantically in her ear, you get over there right now. And she was still puzzled, but uh, obedient to a fault. My, my mother-in-law reluctantly walked over and uh, sat down and forced a smile and forced conversation for about five or ten minutes uh, while this total stranger finished paying his bill. And then he leaned in, gave her a kiss on the cheek. He slid his room key across the table to her. He got up and he left. At which point, Polly's uh, grandmother came running back over and asked, do you have any idea who that was? And clearly, my mother-in-law didn't. So she said, that was Frank Sinatra. <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking. Frank Sinatra was a creep. <laughs> and it may be true, but that, that's not my point in telling you the story. The point of the story is simply that who we think someone is determines how we respond to them. I mean, to, to my mother-in-law, he was just another creepy old guy. But to her mother, I mean, this was old, this was old blue eyes. Right? This was the goat. And so when he calls you over to his table, you go. And friends, I'm convinced that the reason that so many people are so disinterested in the God of the Bible, or worse, so opposed to him, is because they've gotten the totally wrong idea about him. That what comes into their minds when they think about God is not actually who God is. They wouldn't recognize him if he was sitting at the table right beside them. And so when he invites them, they ignore him or worse, they run from him. Unlike Frank Sinatra, God is not creepy. Unlike many non-Christians' perceptions of him, our God is not a cold, calloused, cruel, capricious, condemning, disapproving dictator. 
He's not the cosmic fun police who made up a bunch of arbitrary rules to make sure that no one down here gets to have any fun and who's constantly keeping a running tally to make sure he knows exactly how displeased he needs to be with all of us. That's not our God. Our God is great and our God is good. And because God is great and good, our rightful response to him is to praise him and to proclaim his holy name to others. That is your bulletin this morning. That's all four points right up front. That is uh, Psalm 145 in a nutshell. God is great. God is good. And I know you're all naturally thinking, let us thank him for our food. But we're going to see this morning, we've got so much more to thank him for than just our food. Our proper response to God's greatness and his goodness is, yes, thankfulness and praise indeed. But, but David is also going to call us beyond that to proclaim his praises for the whole world to hear. That's where we're headed. And so uh, would you stand with me one more time as you're able uh, out of respect for the God, uh, reading of God's word, turn in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 145. If you don't have a Bible this morning, we'd love to give you one of those as well. We've got plenty of those at the info bar. Uh, we'd love to give you a free Bible. Uh, but hear the word of the Lord this morning. I will extol you, my God and my King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness, and they shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry, and he saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. And now, Father, may the words of my mouth and may the meditations of our hearts acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. For your glory and in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Greg, I don't know if we can get uh, the slides on the back monitor here as well. Thank you. Um, so Psalm 145 is, uh, I'll give you some context here. It's one of seven acrostic psalms, meaning that each of the uh, 21 verses of Psalm 145 begins with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, uh, etc. And so J.M. Boyce notes in his commentary that Hebrew poetry employed acrostics for three reasons. Number one, it was an artistic device to add a certain beauty to the psalm, much like rhyme does in our poetry. Secondly, it may, it may indicate um, that, uh, that of that s subject, the, the author is trying to cover it 
completely from A to Z, as we might say. And number three, an acrostic may have been a mnemonic device designed to assist young pupils in learning the Psalms. So uh, my, my wife uh, has a gift. She can remember the lyrics to just about every song that's ever come on the radio in her entire life. I, on the other hand, I literally could not sing for you uh, all of the lyrics to my favorite song of all time from uh, memory. I can uh, remember King Griffey Jr.'s batting average from his rookie season because I'm a numbers guy, but, but I'm not a lyrics guy. And so uh, acrostics help folks like me. But this Psalm 145 was particularly important for young Jews to learn because this Psalm is still today recited three times a day by devout Jews all over the world. Twice in the morning and once in the evening, the Talmud declares that all who repeat Psalm 145 thrice daily will have a share in the world to come. And remember, the Psalms were essentially an Old Testament hymn book. Uh, so Psalm 145 is titled A Song of Praise of David. It's actually the final psalm in the Psalter that is attributed to David. And it's the only psalm with this title, A Song of Praise. There are lots of psalms of praise in the Bible, but this is the only one that David himself deemed worthy of that title because it is so thoroughly rich in praise. We're going to find that word praise uh, or a synonym of it nine times in this chapter, and we're going to find the word all 17 times because David wants to emphasize just how comprehensive God's praise is. He is so good to all, to all of his works that all of his works praise him. And now since I've already spoiled the bulletin for you, I want to go ahead and also give you um, my outline for, for the whole chapter as well. Uh, I, I, I'm hoping that it might help give you some sort of frame of reference uh, for the big picture before we dive in verse by verse. So you, you'll see here uh, the whole passage broken down. I know it looks a little trippy, uh, but, but bear with me. We're going to break this down together. Uh, I want you to pay attention especially to the top there, the key um, for each of these colors, because God is great, in orange, therefore we praise him. Because God is good, pink, therefore we proclaim him. That's the blue. Um, and so I want to I quickly also, before we dive in verse by verse, and define these two terms biblically, because sometimes we conflate them, and, and, and sometimes we, we just water them down in the English language. But biblically, when we say that God is great, what we mean is that God is set apart in his perfection. This is not great like, you know, your, your wife's meatloaf was, oh, that was great, honey, you know, last night for dinner. This is, this is set apart in perfection. Greatness carries with it both the connotation of set apartness to be unusual or considerable of extreme or notable degree, distinguished or extraordinary, but specifically in God's case, he is set apart in his perfection. He's wonderful. Diction the dictionary says, very good, first rate, of noble or lofty character, having unusual merit, very admirable. So that's what we mean when we say God is great. He's set apart in his perfection. And God's goodness is related, but to say that God is good is to say that he is benevolently caring. He's characterized by or expressing goodwill or kindly feelings, desiring to help others, feeling or showing compassion. And so another way to think about greatness and goodness is, is to say that God's greatness refers to how amazing God is intrinsically, just in and of himself. God is awesome. To say that God is good refers to how amazing God is towards us. You got that? And so there's, there's obviously some overlap there. We're going to see that in this passage. Some of these verses and phrases could be highlighted in both orange and pink. Um, but as we work our way through here sequentially, we're going we're gonna to start in verse 1 and go to verse 21. We're not going to go topically in the order of your, your bulletin, how I broke it down. And so you, if you want to try and go through and categorize each of these phrases and verses as we go and put it in its appropriate color, uh, you can try that. Good luck keeping up. But here we go. Uh, verses 1 through 3, David says, I will extol you my God and my King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. So David says, we praise God. That's the green. I extol you. I, I bless your name. Every day I will bless you. I praise your name. Why? Because he's great. 
Because great is the Lord and his greatness is unsearchable. Verse 1, he says, we praise him because he is my God and my king. That should remind us of Psalm 47 that we studied a few weeks back. We'll see that crop up again as a a recurring theme here in verses 11 through 13. Especially, God's greatness is most manifested in his kingship in his kingdom. To declare that God is king is to acknowledge him as the one great sovereign ruler over all of life. Psalm 47, God is the king of all the earth. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. Uh, First Chronicles 29, yours, O Lord, Solomon said, is the greatness and the power for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head of above all. You rule over all. He's great. First Timothy 6.15 calls God the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But once again, David is not content to merely affirm God as a king or even as the king. David says here in verse 1, you are my king. You are my God. And our ability to now call God our king is not just good news for you and me, friends. That is the good news. In Christianity, we call it the gospel. We read in Mark chapter 1 that when Jesus arrived on the scene in the New Testament, he said he he came proclaiming the gospel of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, the gospel, the good news, according to Jesus, is that the wait is over I am finally here. Your long-awaited king is here. And we're going to see later why that is such good news for you and me. But for now, the the, the emphasis of verses 1 through 3 is that praise that is due the Lord simply because of his greatness, simply because of who he is. His greatness, verse 3, is unsearchable. The Hebrew word literally means inexhaustible. God's greatness is. It's like a big gulp, like a double gulp. Like no matter how much you drink, you just can't seem to find the bottom, right? His greatness is like a Lord of the Rings movie. Right? Just when you think surely you've come to the end, you realize you're not even halfway done yet. Right? It's endless. The more of his greatness you uncover, the more you realize there is left yet to explore. And in verses 4 through 6, we see a new color show up, blue, David says, one generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. So now David shifts from simply praising God personally to now exhorting his readers, his subjects, his fellow Israelites who are singing along to the song, not just to sing God's praises themselves, but to actually pay it forward to the next generation as well by telling them of God's great works, his mighty acts. That's why we gather as a church for services like our Night of Thanks service tonight. It's to commend God's works to one another and especially to the next generation. Listen, I cannot tell you how many church services I attended as a child growing up. We were there every time the doors were open, at least you know, twice a week, every week, all my life. Literally thousands of services. But I can tell you how many of those services I remember. I remember the one when I decided to follow Jesus, and I remember the Thanksgiving service when they passed the microphone around, and my father stood up and publicly thanked the Lord for rescuing him. Pastor Don Winter, God love him, I'm sure he was a gifted preacher, but I could not tell you one word that he said in 18 years of growing up in that church, but I can tell you exactly what my father said on that Thanksgiving day when he stood up and commended God's works in his life of rescuing him from his son. Let that be a lesson to us parents. Your children might not listen to, might not remember a single word that I preach in all 18 years they grow up at, at West Hills. I pray they, they are more, less sinful than I was. But, you know, Pastor Thad and, and Miss Allie back here, they, they, they can run the best kids and youth program in town. You know, the next-gen ministry, that's all great. But no one is getting through to your kids like you do. You might not think so. It might seem like they listen to everybody else but you, teenage 
you know, parents of teenagers, but I promise you, no one is getting through to your kids like you can. That is why Deuteronomy 6, immediately after God delivers the most important commandment in the whole Bible, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. God's very next commandment is he says, you shall teach these words diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit down in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise. I don't get to, to sit down and lie down and walk and talk all day long with your kids. You do, especially now, right? No more excuses. You're not shipping them off to school and church and stuff anymore. You know, they're, they're stuck at home with you. Right? That's how discipleship happens. It's in the everyday sitting down around the dinner table together. It's, it's while you're walking the dog together as a family. From your rising to your lying down is Jesus a part of every aspect of your life in your home. They say that faith is more caught than it is taught. If you want to commend God's works to your children, then we need to live like the gospel is actually true. And if, if you really believe that you deserve to be in hell right now, but instead you get to enjoy the crisp beauty of a fall day, the, the tender embrace of your loved ones, at the unparalleled deliciousness of your wife's chicken piccata. Right? And one day you're going to get to enjoy all the splendors of heaven for all of eternity with Jesus. If we really believe this good news, then we are naturally going to live like the most joyful people on the earth. And the church's recruitment issues are just going to take care of themselves. Right? The, the, the 80% of, of teenagers who have walked away from the church within five years of their high school graduation that statistic will take care of itself. The next generation, and, and for that matter, the current one, too, they will be lining up out the door. We're, we'll be have to, having to take, you know, even once the capacity limits are, are lifted here, if, if we lived out the gospel, we'd have to take sign-ups for every service. It'd be standing room only. People be lining out the door to get what we got. Our genuine, heartfelt praise and enjoyment of God is the best form of witnessing, proclaiming him to the world that there is. But it doesn't stop there. We see that in verse 6. David's going to say, yes, actions speak louder than words, but we are also still called to speak. Verse 6, he says, they shall speak of the, mighty, of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. And so this whole, you know, maybe you've heard the St. Francis of Assisi quote, uh, that, you know, preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. That's garbage, right? Because we use words whenever possible. Whenever we get the opportunity to tell people about what Jesus has done for us, we're going to do it. Romans 10, Paul says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, but how are they going to call on him who they have not believed in, and how are they going to believe in him of whom they've never heard. Someone's got to tell them, brothers and sisters. That's what Jesus left us here to do, right? We'll, we'll get to praise him for all eternity in heaven. The only thing we won't be able to do in heaven is proclaim him, is to witness, evangelize. That's why we're here. But sandwiched right there in the middle of Psalm 145, you've got verse 5, one generation proclaiming, they shall speak of him. But in the middle, you've got verse 5, on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. You see that green there again, that personal praise, this proclamation, our paying it forward, the, the good news of our great God, it starts, it's got to start with, a, with our own hearts being changed when his people will meditate on what God has done for us. I just want to encourage you this week. Just a practical, you know, just if I can give you something, a practical application, something you can do to try and put this into practice this week. Would you just take one minute every day this week, just 60 seconds, that's it, every day to simply preach the gospel to yourself. Just, just remind yourself every morning when you wake up this, this week, it can be as simple as reminding yourself, I, I should be in hell today. But by the grace of God, I get to be here in this amazing world. And one day I'm going to be in heaven with Jesus forever. Just meditate on that and on the depths that God went to, the lengths he went to to send his son Jesus to die for you, to make that reality possible for you. And see if that doesn't begin, that meditation, if it doesn't begin to increase your joy. And I bet 
that every day of this week will be Thanksgiving. Every day can be Thanksgiving for you, right? If we will meditate on God's good works in our lives. And I bet it starts to spill over into your proclamation as well, the blue, declaring his goodness to those around you. I'll give you one more practical tip on that one, the, 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 the proclamation. I know we're not supposed to be getting together with our extended family for Thanksgiving. I'm breaking the rules, and I am. Maybe you are too. Even if you're just doing Zoom, you know, the, the Zoom thing to check in with your extended family, can I just suggest that you start a new family tradition this year? Every year, my family, when we sit down around the Thanksgiving table, we go around in a circle, and we just share what we're thankful for this past year. It's a beautiful, simple family tradition and I want to encourage you, if you have unbelievers in your family especially, I want you to prayerfully consider, and I, I know that maybe you, you pray for these people regularly, but you evangelize them less regularly because it's awkward or you know that they already know and they're tired of being preached at, they've heard the gospel already, whatever the reason is, but can I just encourage you, you never know, how many times did you have to hear the gospel? before you repented of your sins and believed and trusted in Jesus, right? I just encourage you to take that opportunity this Thanksgiving to share with your loved ones how thankful you are that Jesus rescued you from your sins and raised you to new life in him. And if that, if that is your story, let's proclaim it around our dinner tables this Thanksgiving as a church. Amen? And that's verse 7, verse 7 too, David continues, they shall pour forth the fame. We want to pour forth the fame of God's abundant goodness. They shall sing aloud of your righteousness. And now we get introduced to our final color, the pink, God's goodness, his abundant goodness. God's greatness makes his goodness that much more astounding to us when we realize just how holy and perfect, how awesome and majestic our God is, we truly do have to ask ourselves, as David does elsewhere in the Psalms, you know, what is man that you are mindful of us? God, why does a being like you even take notice of pathetic creatures like us? But inexplicably, friends, he does. He does. And he doesn't just notice us. What do verses 8 and 9 say? He doesn't just notice this. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. That is as glorious a description of your heavenly Father as you will find anywhere in Scripture. Like if, if anyone ever asks you, what is God really like? And if you know that they are envisioning God as that di disapproving dictator, as that uh, you know, dispassionate disciplinarian, take them to Psalm 145, verses 8 and 9. Just, just read it for them. This is reminiscent of Psalm 103 that we had in the call to worship. It's reminiscent of Psalm uh, of Exodus chapter 34, God's own self-description. In Exodus 34, just on the heels of God giving Moses the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapters 20 through 31. And then what do the Israelites do, if you're familiar with the story? Immediately in the next chapter, chapter 32, they build themselves a golden calf to worship instead. But does God give up on his children? Does God, is he the kind of father that just leaves and, and searches out another family to parent instead? No. He declares in chapter 34, I am a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And friends, you and I, cannot help but read those words 3,000 years later now without thinking of Jesus. It is in Jesus Christ, God's Son, that God's grace and his mercy, God's slowness to anger and his faithful covenantal love, God's forgiveness of sin and his merciful invitation to all find their climactic fulfillment in Jesus. 
Listen, David just got a glimpse of God's goodness that we now get to see in full in Jesus. Because on the cross, God's grace and his mercy, his patience and his steadfast love, God's faithfulness and his forgiveness are on full display on the cross. And now, because of Jesus' atoning, sacrificial death, in your place, in my place, God's mercy really is available to all. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. The Bible is clear. The wages of sin is death. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're all sinners, and the wages of sin, what, what is rightfully owed us because of our sin, is death. Separation from God for all eternity, but... Romans 6 goes on, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's the gospel. Trust in him today, and you will be saved. It's the good news of Jesus, and it's so good, it's so good that David just has to take, take a break here in the middle, in verse 10, just to simply praise God again. He says, all your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. Praise is truly befitting of such a great king. And that's who God is. Verses 11 through 13a, God is the all-powerful, all-glorious, everlasting king. You see the blue and the, and the, and the orange come back in here. Uh, David says, they shall speak of the glory of your kingdom. They shall tell others of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures throughout all generations. See, the Bible uses repetition to emphasize a point. And right here, David, uh, in describing God's kingdom, he restates God's power, verses 11 and 12. God's glory, verses 11 and 12. The eternality of God's kingdom, verses 13a and b. All of three of these attributes, power, glory, eternality, are duplicated to emphasize just how great a king our God really is. But he's not the kind of king that we would expect him to be if that's all that you knew about him. Like if, if, if all you knew of God was his all-powerfulness, his, his all-glorious, he's all-sovereign for all of time, you would expect that when that kind of a God came in human form, that he would come in, guns blazing, kick down the doors to Caesar's palace, and just start lighting up these, these godless Roman uh, pagan infidels that are oppressing God's people. That's what the Jews expected of their Messiah. That's the kind of king they wanted Jesus to be. They wanted Jesus to be a new David. You know, David, the guy who collected Philistine foreskins for sport. David, who, of whom the crowds chanted, Saul killed his thousands. David, his ten thousands. We want the new David, his hundred thousands of Romans. As many as it takes to overturn this political power structure and reestablish God's earthly kingdom. But Jesus said, I'm sorry to disappoint you. My kingdom is not of this world. I've got a better kingdom than that to offer you. In fact, he said, I've got some bad news for you. He said, everyone born into this kingdom, the earthly kingdom that, that all of you spend so much of your lives trying to get ahead in, running the rat race, it's hopelessly futile. This world is passing away and, and everything with it, everyone with it. I don't know if you noticed, but 100% of people born into this world will die. And Jesus said in John 3, you have to be born again. You have to be born into a new kingdom, to my kingdom, to a spiritual kingdom, an everlasting kingdom. First Peter calls it an imperishable kingdom that can never be shaken. But this is not just, you know, pie in the sky, by and by, until you die, spirituality. Jesus didn't just preach the good news of the kingdom. He proclaimed, he, he proved, he fulfilled, he manifested that kingdom in his own mighty acts and wondrous works. 
Jesus proved that God isn't just the great king of Psalm 145, verses 1 through 12. He's also the good king of verses 13 through 20. All of the pink that you see there from verses 13b to 20. I'm just going to run through these uh, quickly and show you how every single line, every single description here points us ahead a thousand years to Jesus. Jesus was the one faithful in all his words. 1 Peter 2.22 says he committed no sin, neither was any deceit found in his mouth. Jesus was the one who was kind in all his works. Matthew 4.23, Jesus went throughout all Galilee healing every disease and every affliction among the people. Jesus upheld those who were falling. He raised up those who were bowed down. Jesus touched the lame and they jumped to their feet. He spoke a word and paralytics got up and walked and carried their mats for the first time in their lives. The, the eyes of all looked to Jesus and he gave them their food in due season. He opened his hand and satisfied the desires of every living thing. Jesus didn't just feed thousands with a few loaves and fishes. He fed them with the bread of life. He invited them to come and eat of his own flesh and blood and, and eat and never be hungry again, to be satisfied eternally. Jesus was the one who was righteous in all of his ways. 1 John 3, 5 says, in him there was no sin, but it's even better than that. 1 John 3, 5 says, he appeared to take away sins. How does that work? 2 Corinthians 5.21 explains, For our sake God made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, he was righteous, so that in Christ we might become the righteousness of God. We talk about his imputed righteousness. On the cross, Jesus was trading his righteousness, his right standing with God the Father for all of our unrighteousness so that we could be adopted into God's heavenly family, so that we could be near to God. Jesus is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He declared, I am the truth. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. But then he said, to all who received him, who believed in his name, to all who called on him in faith, he gave the right to become the children of God. You want to talk about nearness to God. You and I are going to sit around God's dinner table one day in paradise for all of eternity because of what Jesus has done for us. Jesus fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears the cries and he saves them. Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's why he came, Luke 19.10, to seek and save the lost sinners like you and me in his goodness and his mercy. And he doesn't just save us. Verse 20, Jesus preserves us. He preserves all who love him. Jesus declared in John 10, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will be able to snatch them out of my hand. And so every line of this psalm prophesies ahead a thousand years to Jesus. He is the greatest, he is the most good, he is the most praiseworthy, the most deserving of our lives, being surrendered in joyful devotion to proclaiming his mercy to all who would listen to us, preach the gospel, and believe. But make no mistake, friends, when we say that every line of Psalm 145 is about Jesus, that means verse 20b as well. Because verse 20b, just when you thought you're going to make it through one whole psalm without David bringing in God's judgment, his wrath, all these wicked people that are going to burn, just when you thought, next to the last verse we hear, all the wicked God will destroy. The same king who came so unexpectedly the first time as a sacrificial lamb to give his life as a ransom for many, has promised that he will come unexpectedly again. He's going to come like a thief in the night. But the next time he returns, Jesus' is second coming, he's coming back not as a lamb, but as a roaring lion. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9 describes 
his second coming like this, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. Friends, the wicked of Psalm 145, all the wicked he will destroy, they're not the people who weren't quite good enough to make the cut into heaven. Again, the Bible makes it abundantly clear We're all sinners who've fallen short of the glory of God. None of us makes the cut into heaven on our own merit. No, the wicked, Psalm 145, are those same people of 2 Thessalonians 1 who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They have not accepted, received, trusted in the good news of Jesus. They are those who in their pride their self-sufficient pride, have refused to admit their sinfulness and their desperate need for a Savior and who have therefore rejected Christ as their King. Remember, let's bring this full circle here at the end. Your theology will determine your response to God. If you think Jesus was just a good teacher, then you might be casually interested in some of his philosophies. If you think Jesus was just a good role model, that he lived, he exampled the kind of life that we should look up to and strive for, then if you're honest with yourself this morning, you're probably incredibly discouraged and guilt-ridden. Because you can try all you want to live up to Jesus' example, but you're n- I just break it to you, you're never going to get anywhere in the zip code, in the solar system of Jesus. He was God in human flesh. You have a crisis of faith when the barista gets your coffee order wrong. He he was perfect. You're not that good. I hate to break it to you. God doesn't grade on a curve. But when you realize that he came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. That if you will but, 1 John 1, 9, confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. When you finally realize that what you need is so much more than a good teacher, so much more than a good role model, you need a Savior. And praise God, that is exactly who he has provided for you in his Son, Jesus. Not just a great Savior, Right? He, not just that he was great enough, that he was able to forgive you of all your sins, past, present, and future. He had to be great enough to be able to conquer sin and hell and death for you. And yet, he had to be good enough to want to do it. He was good enough and loving enough. He wasn't just able, he was willing. And he volunteer, He said, nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down. He voluntarily laid down his life out of love for you and went to a gruesome death on the cross in your place to prove it. And when you realize that, friends, when you realize what he's done for you, your good and great king, the only appropriate response, the only possible response is to praise him. And you're going to want to proclaim his goodness to everyone who will listen. And even those who won't. And so, as for me, I'm with David here at the end in verse 21. May it be said of me that my mouth will speak the praise of the Lord because I want to do my part to spread his praise so that all flesh, the blue, all flesh, 1 Timothy 2, God desires that none should perish but that all should reach repentance, salvation, that all flesh might bless his holy name forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. I want to give you just a moment now as the Holy Spirit leads and calls and draws you just internally. Would you respond? You've heard the gospel this morning. You've heard how great and how good God is. Will you praise him and proclaim him?